Yup, it's us, back with another Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. And boy, do we have some cool stuff for you this time. Kicking off with Tamiya's brand new 172nd scale F35A Lightning II. Yes, it is another F35, but it's Tamiya, so you know it's going to be good. Like the manufacturer's 148 scale Lightning II, the majority of the airframe is in upper and lower halves with subtle ram tape detail molded on. The separate lower nose halves include part of the intakes and sandwich the detailed nose gear bay and the internal parts of the electro-optical targeting system. The horizontal and vertical stabilizers round out the basic airframe. Inside, the cockpit tub gets a multi-part ejection seat, controls, sides, and instrument panel. There's a pilot if you want to add one. The intakes end with a fan, as does the jet nozzle and pipe. Unlike many F-35 kits, this one does not include open weapon bays. But there are detailed main gear bays as part of a sturdy internal structure, and there are pylons and weapons if you decide to build the model in beast mode. The canopy, which can be posed open or closed, is not tinted, but the clear parts also provide the EOTS fairing and wingtip lights. A masking sheet will make painting easier. The decals give markings for two aircraft in the later RAM version, which means a lot less. There's a U.S. Air Force 34th Squadron Lightning II at Hill Air Force Base, Utah in June 2022, and a Japanese Air Self-Defense Force F-35 from 301st Fighter Squadron at Misawa Air Base in September 2022. Typical of Tamiya, this is a state-of-the-art kit of the Lightning II. And it should build into a first-rate replica. In a recent video, we looked at three kits from Takum of the Apache helicopter. You can see a link to that in the description. Now we have the latest version of the 135th scale offering, the British AH Mark I Apache. This is the license-built version of the Apache, built by Augusta Westland for the British Army. As you might expect, this kit shares a lot of the parts with Tacom's earlier AH-64D and E kits. New here are the parts for the Rolls-Royce Turbo Mecca RTM-332, including bodies, fronts, rears, and plenty of details, as well as intakes and engine covers. There are parts for the HIDAS, or Helicopter Integrated Defense Aid System, for the boom and sponsons, as well as elsewhere in the airframe. External fuel tanks and CRV-7 rocket pods finish the Apache's British makeover. New decals give stencils and markings for three British Army AH Mark Ones. It's great to see Tacom turning out other versions of its big Apache. And this one should go together as nicely as the company's other AH-64s. Finally, an interesting release from Tamiya about modeling in action. It's a 135th scale Panzer IV Alfs J with remote control unit. This kit isn't exactly new with many of the plastic parts coming from Tamiya's 1994 Panzer IV family and the RC parts coming from a 2008 release. That said, it's a unique offering. Although modified to fit motors, the lower hull has decent side and rear hull detail. The bogies are molded in place. The upper hull is mostly a single part with the fenders molded on, separate hatches and front plate, tools and spare track links. The turret builds from multiple parts, has a separate bustle stowage bin, and two-part main gun barrel to which is added the muzzle brake. Shirts and armor surrounds the turret. Modified road wheels, idlers and sprockets that attach the suspension with metal pins and C-clasps get wrapped with individual link working tracks which are new to this edition of the kit. A pair of gearboxes control the tracks with one going to each side. A separate unit allows the turret to rotate and the gun to elevate. All of these are wired to the control unit that responds to a 2.4 gigahertz controller. The tank can go forward and backward, turn left and right, and the turret will rotate 360 degrees. Decal supply markings for three German Panzer IVs number 806 in 1944, number 723 in Normandy in August 1944, and number 1032, time and place unknown. So look, this is a really neat re-release that is less of a toy and more of a remote control scale model with nice fine details, good small parts. You know, it's kind of a fun thing. You can chase the cat around the house, alarm your children, <laughs> your spouse, you know, whatever you want to do with it, just have some fun. Look for a review of the F-35 on finescale.com, a place to go for lots of how-to stories like our snapshots, billions of reviews, and just so much more. Billions of reviews? You're gonna go with billions of reviews? We might we might be overselling slightly, but there are a lot. There's, you know, a it couple thousand. It feels like we're putting out billions. <laughs> yes, sure. Okay, I get where you're coming from. 
head over to CombatHobbyStore.com where you can pick up great tools like tweezers and sandy pads. So I've been to a number of shows recently and at every single one of them, somebody has broken something on their mind. Accidents happen, but the interesting thing is that with a room full of modelers, often there hasn't been anybody around with glue or basic tools to help the person put their model back together. Back in 2010, the editor of Scale Auto Magazine, Jim Haught, who was also a colleague of mine, he saw the same thing happening. And he decided to put together a pocket-sized field repair kit. And that appeared in Build Better Model Cars way back in 2010. And I thought it would be a good time now to revisit that idea. The first thing you're gonna need is a box. An Altoids container works wonders. It's pocket sized, it's metal so that it's tough, and it's got a nice hinge and lid that clasps together. The one thing that you're going to want to do when you get it home, get rid of all the candy obviously, but then wash this with warm soap and water because it will be sticky on the inside. Next, an old business card. It is a great multitasking tool, and you're gonna hear a lot about multitasking during this video. Uh, you're probably going to have to trim it to get it to fit into the Altoids box. I, you know, I've cut this here, and I actually cut off maybe 3 16 of an inch off the end here. But a business card can work as a glue palette, as a paint palette. It can help square up parts on a model if you need to, if you need to square them up. And if in a pinch you need a ruler, you can go ahead and put tick marks down here in your measurements of choice. You can do metric, you can do inches if you wish, whatever works for you, but this can then be a ruler in a pinch. So right down in the bottom of the Altoids box. What do we need as modelers? Glue. Now you're probably not going to be able to find plastic cement in nice small size tubes, but you can find super glue and super glue is always useful. You can get it in a couple of different viscosities, thin and thick, and just go ahead and put those right in like that. At the same time, what you probably want to do is have an applicator. I recommend glue loopers. Now, you don't have to put a new glue looper in here, but an old one that you're not afraid of losing, you know, you, you perform some, uh, some repairs at the show and then you toss it in the trash and then replace it, remember to replace it, that'll work well for you in your field kit. Of course, we need a knife. You're not gonna be able to fit a whole number 11 blade and handle in here and number 11 blades by themselves are going to be a little bit hard to use, so a good, alternative is a straight razor blade. In my case here, the box of razor blades that I have doesn't come with the typical cardboard sheath. If that happens to you, you can make a makeshift sheath with a post-it note. Just use the sticky, stick it right to the blade, fold it over, make sure that you've got enough to keep it covered and attached, and then just trim it up. Now, not as easy to use as a number 11 blade, but it is sharp and it will do the job. Just be careful. Next up, sanding pads. Now we talked about sanding pads, sanding sticks and files in a, in a previous tooling around. Well, here we go. We're gonna go ahead and add them to the field repair kit. Probably nothing too coarse. You're at the show, so everything's pretty refined. Um, you can choose, if you can find a small uh, sanding file that'll fit in there, that's great. Uh, these Green Stuff World sanding pads work really well, or you can cut other sanding sticks into, you know, small enough to fit in. Right here, I've got 280 grit, 400, and 600. That's probably great for just doing some, uh, some quick work for a repair job. You heard me earlier say multitaskers, these are multitaskers, toothpicks. Not only can you pick your teeth with them, should you have something stuck from lunch at the show, but you can also stir paint with them. You can apply super glue with them if the, uh, 
if the glue looper is no longer available. We always find a number of different ways to use toothpicks, don't we guys? Anyway, it's a good idea to have three, four, five of them in the field repair kit. What if you need a hole punched or drilled in the model? A T-pin with a sharp point will work wonders. Nice handle right here to give you some, some leverage and then you can just go ahead and open up that hole that you may need. There's another option that you can go with and that is a push pin. They're often pretty sharp and again, it gives you a nice, a nice handle to just sort of push through and open up a, an area that maybe it got occluded with some glue. And you know what? Why not have both of them just in case? Another multitasking tool that a field kit would be incomplete without, cotton swabs. There's three or four of them, you put them right down in here. You guys know you're gonna need them at some point. Other good tools to have on hand, micro brushes. You can get micro brushes pretty inexpensively and usually their sets come with a small, medium, large fuzzy brush and then an actual brush with bristles. Good for applying paint, or you could also apply thin super glue with them. Don't leave home without them. The one thing I will tell you is that they are out of the package, too long to fit in an Altoid box, so just go ahead and trim the ends off and they will fit just fine. What if you need to glue together two parts that don't wanna stay together? Right here. I've got some blue painter's tape wrapped around the end of, well, what was a bamboo skewer, which I trimmed down to, to fit into the box here. But blue painter's tape is good to have on hand. Not only can you use it to mask, but like I say, you can use it at, to, to tape two parts together. You know, if you have body halves or something, something came apart, you can use this tape to hold those two pieces together. You'll probably find some other uses for this tape too when you're in the field. Speaking of holding parts together, if you need a makeshift clamp, nothing's better than a couple of rubber bands. So just go ahead, grab a couple. Right here, I've got two of the same size. I probably should swap those out and put a, put a smaller one in there. Um, but for the time being, this just goes right into the repair kit. Another versatile tool, a multitasker, is poster putty or poster tack. Um, it's pliable, somewhat sticky, but it's good for holding a part in position while maybe you're using your hand somewhere else. Um, you can prop open doors, hoods, hatches, and the like with it. It's just nice to have it on hand. Last but not least, the lowly pencil. I mean, I, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. You can write notes to your buddies, pencil down an email address or a phone number, or if you need to mark something on your model, you can do that too. Always good to have a pencil on hand. What's really good about this field repair kit is that it is customizable to what you need. Let's say you are a car modeler and you use bare metal foil on your models. It might make sense then for you to have a small square of bare metal foil in this kit so that you can do a repair at the show. Or it might make sense for you to have a small swatch of soft cloth so that you can polish off smudges and fingerprints and, and those sorts of things. Just remember, whatever you wanna put in here, just that it makes sense for what you want to accomplish at the show. Then you go ahead, close it up. Now, you may want to put a label on here. Maybe a piece of tape across here that says, pocket size field repair kit, whatever. But just so, so that you know that this is indeed your tools and not candy. One last thing, when you get back from the show, if you've used anything out of your field repair kit, make sure to go through it and replace those things so that you're ready to go the next time you're headed to a show. So about a month ago, we talked about how we were already working on the January, <laughs> the January, February issue for next year. And we had asked for some questions about paint that people would like uh, for us to answer in that, in that issue. And we've gotten a lot of questions and that's great. If you have them, keep them coming. Thanks guys. 
But there are some questions that we've dealt with uh, in the past, in, either you know in the print issues or in video. And I thought that there was one of those that we could you know get cleared up right now, and that is the order of operations, right? Um, what paints can you use on top of other paints? And you, a few years ago, wrote an article about about that particular about that particular subject. Yes. So the basic rule is, lacquers should not go over the top of anything. You can use them under anything, enamels or acrylics. Not on top of anything other than the, like a lacquer primer yeah, themselves. Right. Lacquers can go over lacquers until the cows come home. Sure. But you don't want to put them over enamels or over acrylics. Neither one of them copes very well with that lacquer on top. Because they're it just will, so aggressive. Yes, lacquers the, are so aggressive. That solvent is really aggressive. It also is why you want to be careful putting it over even bare plastic. Right, because, because it, can it will eat, yeah, eat it will through craze plastic. the plastic and trust As us. As you so yeah. well know. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll etch it really good, even mm. under paint. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or over paint, rather. Well, and that was that particular, that was hitting other uh, Lacquers. lacquer paint. Yeah. 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 So, you'll, you'll know what we're talking about yeah. soon enough. Yeah, it wasn't fun. Um, but you can then put enamels and acrylics over lacquers. You can use acrylics over enamels and lacquers, but you probably don't want to use enamels over acrylics. Now, here's the thing. I can already hear some of you out there going, well, wait a minute, I do, and I, I, yes, totally. Right. This is, we're talking about general rules for beginners. You know, if you've been out there and you know that acrylic paint X really holds up under enamel paint Y, and you've been painting those enamels over those acrylics for years, that's great. Continue on with what it is that you're doing. But just as a general rule for safety, and so somebody doesn't end up with their model turning into a molten slag heap, this is this is what we're this right. is what we're saying. Now the other thing is and just taking that extra step then when weathering, I mean, I use oil washes and, and enamel washes over acrylics all the time. Right. Usually, however, there's a there's a clear coat between what I'm putting on top of, you know, there's an right. acrylic clear coat that's protecting the the color underneath. Right. But I have had, because, you know, being aggressive or whatever, um, I have had enamels and oils go through an acrylic clear coat right. and start to affect the color underneath. Yeah, because normally what we suggest is if you're mixing a wash, you want to use an oil or enamel wash over an acrylic base because that way you don't affect the, right. if you do it, if you use an enamel, enamel thinner, which is essentially dirty thinner is what washes are, over enamel paint, there's a good chance it's going to start eating into that enamel paint. But you also want to be careful because we've both had experiences where those aggressive thinners have affected acrylic undercoats. That's why there are acrylic washes, washes out there too exactly. that tend to be water-based and are unlikely to affect properly cured acrylic paint. All of these are caveats and it all comes with experience and learning how you use your paint, which paints you use, and all of that kind of stuff. Right. And remember, not all acrylic paints are created the same way either. There are water-based acrylics. A lot of your craft paints are water-based acrylics. Vallejo is water-based. Um, AK. AK. But then you have, you know, like alcohol-based acrylic paints, which would be more your Tamiya and... Uh, Mr. Hobby. Mr. Hobby um, paints. So, in any case, a lot of it just comes through with experience, right. but those are the basic rules for applying, you know, the order in which you can apply paint. If you have any other questions about paint, we'd love to hear it. Or if you have experiences with specific kinds of paint and the order in which you have put them on, definitely let us know in the comments below, or you can send us um, your, your comments at editor findscale.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> tubes. It's a tube. Internet's tubes, man. What is the joke? Become a dad joke?
but it's apparent. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I'm gonna have to tuck that one away. That one, that one comes out tonight at dinner. Let's not confuse them too awful bad. Not that you're easily confused. That's not what I meant. Actually, this is the end of the bamboo. Bamboo. We're gonna do that again because I'm just like. I'm Whoa. Gotta watch out with the hands. Oh! You can see a link to that in the. You can see it as. <laughs> she doesn't have a lot of uh, outtakes at this point. Yeah, that's true. At least not funny ones. <laughs>